I had knee surgery this week. And when you have knee surgery or any kind of surgery, any kind of setback medically from your plan, it is good to already have a plan in place um, so that you don't have to sort of lean on your feelings at the time. And, uh, and so we are going to look at this text because uh, it's next. And, um, and we're looking at this text next because we're in the study of Galatians. And um, if it were up to me looking at the text that Ron just read, knowing what my mind has been kind of squirreling around with this week, I'd be like, ooh, I do not want to go there. Uh, but we're going to look at it because it's next and we're going to commit to it and we're going to get there. But before we do that, we're going to release our Grace Kids to the Grace Kids ministry time. They're going to go with our Grace Kids staff. They're back there. So all of our youngest worshipers, you're going to go uh, with our team back there. And if you are unfamiliar with what we do here, you can... You can maybe go and walk them back, parents, if you want to, and know that they're going to be cared for, they're going to be taught the gospel, and they're going to celebrate what it means to be loved by God, um, and just as we're going to be doing that here. So we love our Grace Kids team, and we love what's going on uh, in, in the growth of our families, and Lauren and her family are a big part of that. So thank you, Lauren and team. So... Um, but like I was saying, when you look at a text that Ron just read, Galatians 1, 6 through 9, this would have been a good week for me to say, ooh, don't want to go there. That's kind of harsh. It's kind of brutal. It's kind of abrupt. Uh, this is not the week I really want to do that. This is a week where you kind of need to be active mentally, active physically. And what I love about preaching through a book of the Bible is we are forced as a congregation to submit to the word and submit to the presentation of the word. And so this is what's next. This is what we're looking at. And really, as of yesterday, it, it, the switch flipped in me that I am so excited that we get to look at this text today on this weekend. So let's look at it. We have a lot to look at, a lot of what's going on here. If you're just joining us, we are in this series of Galatians, the only gospel. We're doing this because we notice that in our day and age, it seems like news, truth, facts are only what they appear to be from the one giving the news. And we started this series several weeks ago, and we talked about the importance today, it seems like, in our culture for fact-checking and, and what is the true news, what is fake news, all that kind of stuff. And, and we know that when we begin this letter, Paul gets right into it, that there is fake news being brought to you, Galatians, and y'all are buying into it. And so we're looking at this book of Galatians, the only gospel so that we can make sure we are centered on the right news. Week one, we talked about how this is not Paul's news. This is not the Church of Galatians news. This is God's news. This is God's gospel. It didn't arrive from him. It didn't derive from him. He's simply the mouthpiece of the message of God coming through him to the people. This is God's message. We looked at a few weeks ago that this is the true gospel in verses 3 through 5. Let's look at that with me again as we get into verse 6. Paul addresses them. He says, grace to you, peace from God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present age according to the will of our God and Father. And to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That is a great introduction for the people that Paul has come to love and appreciate. And then he gets right into this verse 6 through 9. Now, this text causes us to ask some important questions. Question number one that we're going to look at is, what is it that shocks Paul? What is it that seems to astound him and amaze him? And, and why? What's the big deal? We look in this text and we see that there is a different type of news, a different type of gospel that is coming to them and that they're buying into. And Paul says it's disturbing the church. Why? Why is it disturbing the church? Why is this new news so disruptive? And then we see these very strong words in verse 8 through 9, 
where Paul makes this hard warning and he talks about, let them be cursed who's bringing this type of news, this different news. So why is that? So let's look at all three of these. That's where we're going today. What is it that shocks Paul? Paul is saying here in verse 6, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him. Paul is saying, I marvel. I'm dumbfounded. I wonder about. I'm amazed. I'm astounded. There is a gospel that came to you, and you have chosen to turn away from it. And not only the gospel, he said, you're turning away from Jesus. You're turning away from him to another message. This amazes Paul. To the Galatians, he tells them that he's astonished, he's amazed that you're turning away from Christ. You're turning away from the grace that he gives. You're turning away from him being the one glorified. You're turning away from that to glorify people, to glorify tradition, to glorify other things. You're turning away. Now think about this from Paul's perspective. Remember, Paul and his team preached in this area, raised up some believers, some followers, and there are people there that are gathered in this area, and, and now others have come in behind them and have been adding to the message. Think about what Paul has seen up until this moment. Paul has seen the struggles, the turmoils, the sufferings of those who have given their lives to follow Jesus. He has seen the real turmoil, the real pressure, the real agony of families being ripped apart of those who are devoted followers of Jesus. He has seen also positively the amazing work of the gospel. He's heard about it coming to these people and how it's transformed families. He's seen how families have been made new and how the city was begin to, beginning to change and how everything was taking place for the good he has seen these things. We've got to remember that before he was Paul the Apostle, called by God, he was Saul of Tarsus on a mission to kill those who follow Jesus. We've got to remember that Saul of Tarsus, this one who the Holy Spirit spoke to to write to them, oversaw the death and the stoning of Stephen. He witnessed Somebody crying out to the last moment, the last breath, what it means to devotedly follow the gospel message of Christ. And so he writes to them and he says, I don't get it. I've seen a lot of people endure. I've seen a lot of people practice the right things. I've seen a lot of people give their lives. I'm amazed that you are turning away. They're turning away to a different gospel. Now, this is where it's important for us to really understand this, to make clear what we mean by the gospel. What is Paul amazed? What are they turning from? Well, similar things were happening in the city of Corinth, and he wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians these words. He says, For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received. Okay, so what he's about to say, he is saying the most important thing, Corinthian church, that you can get from me is the very first thing I told you. It's the very first thing I told you. It's the most important thing I told you. And I'm ending my letter here, Corinthians chapter 50, telling you this. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. Here it is. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. When we talk about the gospel, the simple, pure, powerful message of the story of the gospel, that is it. That Christ came, sent by God the Father, to die for our sins. And he died, and he was buried, and three days later he rose again. That's the message. These Galatians, for some reason, are turning not only from the message, they're turning from the one who saved them. 
Paul's astounded by this. I just got my fuzzy thing off. Um, I guess that's just to protect from spit. Paul is astounded by this. He's amazed that they are turning away from something so profound and so simple. Someone has come in, come behind him, has muddled the message, and they're like drinking polluted water now. The Galatians are drinking it up, and it's astounding Paul because nothing tastes sweeter to him than the beautiful news of the amazing grace of God through Jesus Christ. So, what does turning away from Christ, turning to a different gospel, look like? What is this different type of water that they're drinking? What is this different message that they're leaning on? Well, for the Galatians, what was happening is some Jewish traditionalists were coming up behind Paul and behind the teachers, and they were telling these new believers that they now must go back and practice some things in Jewish law in order for them to really experience a relationship with God. They had to go back and practice Jewish law. Mainly what we're talking about is circumcision. So the gospel came to these Gentile believers, these non-Jewish believers. It is good news. Finally, all people are coming and hearing the gospel. And then Paul leaves, and then Jewish people were coming behind him saying, it is good that God's included you. That is wonderful. He is a great God. Here's what now you need to go do. You need, all your men need to go and be circumcised. If you want to experience the oneness with God, the forever holding of God, you need to add this work to your belief. Now remember how important the covenant of circumcision was for the Jewish people. This was their A, their, their great act of faith that united them as God's children, that singled them out as God's children, that marked them forever as God's children. This was for them an important reminder of God's eternal promises to hold them, to keep them and say, you're forever mine. So the spin, most likely, was with good motives given to these new believers who were non-Jews saying to them, this is good, but now let me show you how to really be enlightened in your relationship with God. Let me give you a deeper understanding of God and how he wants to work. They probably thought they were helping the Galatians. They probably thought they were giving them something that would allow them to be even closer with God. They were adding traditional authority to the gospel. And that's a key word for us. For the Galatians here in this text, there's a lot more going on, but one thing we know for sure that's going on is people were coming in and adding traditional authority to the authority of the gospel. This is what was going on for them. What does it look like for us? We can also in our day get caught up in turning from the pure, simple gospel and turning to something else. What are the, what I'm calling the partnering authorities? to the gospel that we tend to buy into. Let's look at a few of those. I call these extra authorities or partnering authorities that we tend to buy into in the church today. The first one I call social authority. In order for us to really be one with the church, if we're going to be really united with the church, we must have our act together socially is what this one says. That means in order for us to really understand what it means to be saved, to be saved, to have joy of salvation, there can be no bad habits, there can be no addictions, but instead we must, to think about it in a phrase, we must look the part to be a part. We must look the part of a Christian in order to be a part of the Christian church. This is an added social authority that we put onto the gospel, that we make people feel that God should fix us first, before we can be saved. Maybe you have felt like that in the church. Well, I want to tell you, I'm sorry, that this is extra. The gospel is not about fixing and cleaning you up first. 
and then saving you. No, the gospel is that Jesus Christ came to save you. And everything we add to that about getting clean and getting fixed and being perfect is a social authority we put up there. We would love for all of our people to be in right standing in the community, but the reality is Jesus saves those who are not in right standing in the community. It's a social authority we add. There's also what I call the experiential authority. This is the one that says, in order for us to feel that we belong to the family of God, we must have served long enough. We must bring some sort of experience of our religious faith or practice that validates being saved. This looks like a whole bunch of different things. If you are somebody who checks church attendance regularly and that is the measure of whether or not you are really saved or not okay I've got a lot of stars on this month I actually grew up in a church I loved the church I grew up in it taught me the gospel it taught me a lot of things but I remember very well that I needed to go to Sunday school because I wanted to make sure I had the most stars at the end of the poster board A lot of times when we talk about being saved, instead of just talking about the pure gospel that Jesus came to save me, we, we add to the story. And, and since then, I've been, I've been volunteering here and I've been doing this and no one outworks me and I give all this and I do all this. And so what's getting glorified when you're talking about that? Your work, your experiences in the church. This is the partnering authority that says, here's the good news, but it's mixed with, let me see your credentials so that you can be accepted. This is often seen and argued in how we endorse different types of practices and experiences in the local church. I have seen this happen and been questioned about this often when I was in seminary. I was going to somewhat conservative seminary, and I had some friends that were going to uh, some pretty um, aggressive charismatic churches and my accountability these are brothers of mine these are people we pray with and i talk with and we we ask the spirit to work in our lives with and one time he came after uh, a weekend at his church he came to me he said jason i don't think you're saved what are you talking about and he talked to me he said jason i just got to ask you have you ever been baptized by the holy spirit and i'm like I know where that's coming from in Scripture. I know where you're getting that language. But that's not the gospel. That's a gift, experience you had in your church, and y'all are practicing that. That's great. I applaud you for that. That's wonderful. But don't tell me I'm not saved. Because I didn't have the experience that you had in a congregation. Another church I worked at one time, um, I was teaching some men in men's group time, and uh, as I was teaching, this guy held up his hand and, and asked, Jason, have you ever been on a walk yet? Many of you know where I'm going. And I knew what he was talking about because I heard the language in the conversations in this church all the time. And I said, but I just want to entertain him. I said, what walk are you referring to? I've been walking with the Lord since I was seven, so tell me what walk you're referring to. And he said, I, well, walk to Emmaus. Now, if you're familiar, a lot of this began in the Methodist movement. It's this, it's this retreat, this time, the conference time where you get away and you hold your phone up, your keys, you kind of turn it all in and you just, you're alone with the Lord and alone with other people and you sort of you learn more about yourself and your relationship with God. But what was happening in this one church is the measurement of my joy and my salvation for them was hitting a roof because I had not yet gone on a walk. And half the guys, when I said, no, I haven't been to that yet, and I don't know if I'm going to one of those, a lot of them just tuned me out the rest of the time. Because I hadn't had, with my salvation, the experience that they had. We have experiential authorities in our church all the time. We have a social authority. We have experiential authority that we mix in. We have also what I call an emotional authority Listen, it is never, ever a prerequisite to show the same emotion that Zacchaeus did when he got saved. You remember Zacchaeus? He's climbing a tree. He's eating with Jesus. He's giving everything away. I mean, it's very 
uh, very open and honest. This is a dude that's going crazy for Christ. How many times have you felt like your salvation, your joy in the Lord doesn't measure up because the person next to you is going all out with his hands up and he's singing and he's got this emotion involved. One of the godliest men in my life that I know is a friend of mine. He was saved. He found the grace of God while in prison. And while he was in prison, he fell in love with the Bible and the message of the gospel and that he could be saved. And several years later, we're in our uh, church. We went to a conference together. It's a Sovereign Grace Ministries conference. Actually, we're together for the gospel conference. And we're there. And the, the preaching of the word is awesome. The worship's incredible. And I'm, I'm an emotor. I'm an emotional guy. I'm passionate. My friend Tim's not. He could be there like this the whole time. And he was like that. And because I know what's going on in his heart, I didn't question it, but I, I leaned over to Tim. I said, Tim, isn't this great? Isn't this incredible? And Tim looked at me and he leaned over to me and says, I'm about to rip the guy's arm off next to me and beat him with it. <laughs> now, what's going on is Tim is like, there's this guy next to him, two, two people down from me, whose arms are like this. And Tim's constantly like avoiding doing this number the whole time. Now, Tim was sure enough, and his feet were planted deep in the gospel, that he didn't measure his emotion with the guy next to him. In fact, he even confessed later, he's like, my heart was so rotten to think that of that guy. We do this all the time. We feel that if we are saved, we're supposed to always feel like we are saved. Have you ever asked anybody this news whenever they've come up out of the water in baptism? Have you said, well, how do you feel? Well, everybody's looking at me right now. I don't, I, right now, I'm just kind of embarrassed. When does our outward emotions dictate what is going on in our mind and heart. Now, I do believe what we think eventually works into our emotions. Thinking's important, but never are we supposed to put onto the gospel the authority of our emotions. Some examples of this are people that I admire. A man by the name John Newton and William Cooper. William Cooper and John Newton were contemporaries. And John Newton, if you know the story, was a, a slave trader. He, he was thrown overboard, got saved. He wrote the song Amazing Grace. He's got a long history of writing hymns. And he wrote hymns with a partner called the Olney Hymns. And his partner is William Cooper. William Cooper, if you know anything about him, it it's actually looks like Cowper, C-O-W-P-E-R. William Cooper, Cooper, tried to take his life several times. He was clinically depressed most of his life. And he wrote with John Newton amazing hymns declaring the joy of the gospel of God. There were times that he would show up on John Newton's door and he'd say, John, I need your help. I need you just to tell me the gospel. Tell me it's not about the way I feel right now. And John would just recite the song Amazing Grace to him. And he would point them to the scripture and say, it's not about what you're feeling right now. It's what you believe in your heart about what God's done for you. Even the work of emotion is added to the gospel sometimes for us. We also see that there's a partnering authority called theological authority. I want to be careful here. Everything I say might lead you to think I'm against theological depth, I'm against emotion, or I'm against experience. I'm not against any of it. But I see this one play out in small groups all the time and in churches. Some have just recently come to the Lord. They have this new birth, this like baby-like faith. And they come in contact with somebody who's got the, the theological weight of a 400-pounder. And it just crushes them. You're reading that copy of Scripture? You're doing this? Instead of applauding the work of God's grace in somebody's new life, they are misapplying the theology that they know. And it crushes people. It's kind of what's going on here with the Galatians. We have 
people coming and saying, you don't know enough. I've got the experience. I've got the emotion. We've got the connection with God. You've got to add this to it. Let me show you something else. And it wasn't right. Sometimes the force of our theological depth causes others to feel shame about a basic faith. My desire is that when people come into this room, when they see somebody that has some theological depth that they don't have, that they would see them and go, oh, I would love to know God like that. I would love to know the doctrines of grace like that. I would love to embrace and learn and know that. I would love, just not there yet. Instead, what happens a lot in churches is they see that and they run from those people because they don't want to talk to them. They're afraid they're going to bully them. So here's some encouragement for you if you are gaining theological insight. When we discover new things about God, and we should be, Worship, worship, write, find creative outlets to express your joy and the newness of God that you have. Don't evangelize your doctrine, evangelize the gospel. Theological authority can so quickly cause us to leave the simple gospel when we don't accept people until they get what we get, right? There's, this also leads to the last one, intellectual authority. Nothing promotes disunity more than making other church members feel that they're lesser in God's eyes because of what they've learned or their educational level. Church structures should not be built or based on social standing, experiential authority, and it should not be based on how many educators do we have in our congregation. When we were interviewing for elders and deacons, I never once asked about the educational skill of the people that I was interviewing. I would ask about experiences during seasons of life that involved them being at college or if they went to college, whatever. But I never measure who's going to be leading our church spiritually by how many degrees they have on their wall. Intellectual authority says... That in order to be heard, you must have a degree or well-studied. Case in point, I want to give to you two other heroes in time, John Bunyan and John Owen. John Owen was considered the greatest theologian of all time at, to some. He was in direct relationship with King Charles II. King Charles II leaned on John Owen for all things important and heavy um, theologically. But John Owen would go and hear John Bunyan preach. John Bunyan had hardly no education. Flunked out of school, quit school, was poor, but he, he found the grace of God, became a preacher. King Charles heard about John Owen going to hear John Bunyan, who was a tinker by trade. And he asked the doctor, Owen, why someone as thoroughly educated as him would want to hear a mere tinker preach. The great John Owen replied, May it please your majesty, if I could possess the tinker's ability to grip men's hearts, I would gladly give it exchange for all my learning. What he's saying there, there's something real, there's something pure, there's something that you can't measure by education that happens when people just can't get past what it means to be saved by grace. In Acts 4, Verse 13, when Peter and John were preaching, it was said about them, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. Just like the Corinthians and just like the Galatians, we also can quite easily pollute the water of the pure gospel with these partnering authorities. I'm not saying that we should not give attention to social awareness and standing. We, shouldn't, uh, we should ignore experiences and, and uh, emotions. I'm not saying that we should ever get rid of theology and doctrine and education. What I am saying is the gospel message is profound 
and it's simple and it's beautiful enough that it doesn't need our additions. So Paul says to them, I am amazed you're adding to the gospel. I'm amazed you're turning from the simple, pure gospel to these things. And then Paul gives a troubling warning to the church. Now, before we look at that warning, we need to understand why this is so troubling for the church. A different gospel is troubling because it distorts how people interact with each other. Think about it. The greatest news, the purest news, news about a right relationship with the Creator God, a news about the Creator God restoring what was broken with people. And we add to it works. And we say, that doesn't matter. We need to add to this. It added to the works of the gospel. It created disunity. Forever the Galatians were going to feel that they were always inferior to the Jewish people. Even if they went and got themselves circumcised, they can feel like, okay, I did it. But always it's going to be like, no, the Jewish people are still always better. How often do we, with our partnering authorities, cause people to feel that they don't quite measure up? It's disturbing. It's disruptive because... People come into this room and they're so hungry to belong to God. And because of the way we might distort the gospel, they feel less than God wants them to feel. May we never, never, never be guilty of causing people to feel less because they don't know what we know they don't have the theology that we have. They don't have the experiences that we have. If they can take communion, which is what we're about to do, and they can say with each other, yes, I believe this, then we all celebrate the oneness of the pure gospel. And so Paul gives them an indictment, verse 8 and 9. But even if an angel, we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel... Contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As we have said before, and I'll say again, if anyone's preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, a curse be on him. These are harsh words. What does he mean by this curse? And are we cursed? How do we avoid this curse? The word is anathema. Curse, anathema. In the Greek, it literally means something or someone left for judgment of God, by God. Basically, Paul's saying, you are left over to God. I am releasing you. If you are so quickly turning from Christ, you're turning from the Son of the One who sent Him, you're turning from His news, you're adding to it, then I'm done with you. You're left in God's hands now. And you can hear the tone in this anathema, this curse saying, God's going to deal with you and it's not going to be pretty if you reject his mission, his word, his gospel. This is strong indictment. This is how Paul begins his letter to them. Basically saying, don't, don't add to the gospel. Don't subtract from the gospel. Don't add different authorities to it. If you do, and you listen to them, and those who are bringing it, then they're going to have to stand before God. Let me ask this morning, as we move to our time of consideration and communion, are you, are you in any way adding to the gospel in your life? Are you basing your appreciation of the gospel and what God's done for you on your feelings and how others look up to you, on how much you, you know of the Bible theologically or some experience from some church tells you you've got to have first? People of grace, my aim week after week after week is to not move you past the gospel but to move you into a deeper appreciation of it. And one thing we do at our church, as, as is our custom, is we take communion. 
This is to be the solemn reminder of this is what Jesus has done. This is what I believe. This is what's helping me. If you don't get anything else in any of the sermons, get that when the elements come to you, the bread and the juice, they are reminders. They are elements to remind us this is the body of Christ that was given for you. This is the blood of Christ that washes you new. To take these things is to say, yes, I believe, I believe. And in God's eyes, and in this church's eyes, that makes you one with me. Don't turn from it. Don't add to it. Let everything that comes from that, the theological growth, the emotions, the experience, all that, let it just be an overflow of your worship to what he has already done. Let's pray. As I pray, I'm going to ask our guys to get into place to distribute the elements. And I guess before I pray, I, I want to say to you, these words that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, I want to remind them, remind us for, as Paul says, I deliver to you of a first importance that Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with Scripture. Do you believe this? If you do, when the elements come down the row or the aisle for you, take the bread. Take the cup. Know that this is a, a symbol applied for your salvation. If you have never made that public, let me know. Let somebody know. Don't leave here today saying, I just believe that, but I've never told anybody about that. Tell somebody. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are good to us. We how dare we ever think that we should add to the gospel? But God, we, we're so prone to do it. We want people to experience what we've experienced. We want them to, to think like we think. We want them to, to emote like we emote. And God, we're just different. You made us all different. Lord, I pray that we would at this church forever and ever and ever celebrate that Christ died for our sins. All of them. And that after his death, he was laid in a tomb. And three days later, he conquered death. Oh God, may we be a people that never get over that. May we be a people that always celebrate that. And I pray that now, Lord, as we take these elements, Lord, that you would be forever glorified in our worship.